Thanks for the opportunity to speak to with you this morning. I want to talk about ventilation within the spectrum of preventative activities. Now, first of all, looking at the risk factors, this nice infographic from the ACGIH identifies enclosed spaces, poor ventilation, and many people, along with many minutes, as some of the risk factors for becoming infected in indoor places. And uh, obviously, a school has a number of these. The WHO provided this information on the three C's, uh, avoiding crowded places, close contact settings, and confined and enclosed spaces with poor ventilation. This was expanded at a virtual conference back in August of 2020, and they came up with six more, along with a seventh that I've added myself, which includes a lack of circulation or outdoor air supply. Now, the way we found out uh, that this virus is transmitted through the air was by some experience in various places, including this choir in S Skagit Valley, where 53 out of 61 people attending were infected by a single person. Well, a similar case happened in Amsterdam, where 102 people out of 103 members of a choir and orchestra became infected. However, none of the, uh, the attendees of the concert were infected. In Hong Kong, in also in March, we saw occasions where apartment buildings vertically arranged uh, were infected from each other through exhaust from the bathrooms being taken in by uh, air conditioning units in the kitchens. This was similar to a case that happened in Korea where the vertical apartments um, became infected because of a temperature inversion that caused the gravity ventilation from the bathrooms to be pushed into uh, different apartments. And if you think about it, here's a, a light scattering picture of a toilet being flushed and you can see the particles uh, going up and some coming back down but others going in other places and the colored diagram beside shows where the greatest concentration of these particles fell. And this also happened in SARS-1. We had the reports of uh, apartment buildings experiencing um, outbreaks due to wind direction and reverse um, ventilation happening through bathrooms. Despite all this, the WHO decided that it was not airborne. In fact, they suggested that people who were claiming it was airborne were propagating fake news. However, a few months later, they reversed themselves um, and uh, recognized that there was quote-unquote emerging evidence of airborne spread. However, if you look back, we knew this already from previous pandemics. The PHAC recognized it in November that, again, uh, aerosols could cause infection at a distance greater than in close contract contact, especially in poorly ventilated areas, and recommended drawing in as much fresh air as possible. And when you look at what happens when people cough or sneeze or b even breathe and talk, uh, you can see from this diagram uh, the, blue, the green projectiles are the large particles, the droplets, and they fall to the floor quite readily. However, the red puff that comes out is the aerosols, the small particles, and once they lose their velocity, they get picked up by the air currents and carried around in the room. And here you can see it in a more uh, illustrative way. And uh, if you look at the bottom one with the blue spaghetti, it looks actually uh, something that you might see in a nightmare. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what an aerosol generating procedure is. And um, 
Michael Klumpus was a doctor who was uh, an ardent advocate of the droplet approach at the beginning of the pandemic. However, as the science came in, he realized that this was no longer the case, that it was too simplistic, and that uh, it's not a dichotomy, but a continuum. And he suggested uh, that if you look at the aerosol generating procedures, the same thing happens when people are coughing or heavy breathing or even talking loudly. And so he suggested that the term aerosol generating procedure is a misnomer. It is not the procedure that increases the risk, but the sustained proximity to the respiratory tract of a highly symptomatic patient or person. So this shows what happens uh, when somebody coughs or sneezes or even speaks and breathes heavily. Uh, particles come out, the big particles, the green ones, and, and smaller and smaller. And as time goes on, the larger particles start to settle out on the floor. And you can see that it moves into the areas beyond person B, but not quite at person C yet. And as time goes on, you can see the large particles on the floor and the small ones circulating throughout the room. And depending on how good the ventilation is in the room will, de will determine uh, what the concentration of those other particles that will reach a person C. That's why distance is so important. It's the inverse square law that uh, the f as you increase your distance from the source, the concentration of, of the uh, particle actually decreases by the square of the radius of the circle in a perfectly uh, um, still room. Obviously, if there are air currents, that will change things. And if you're wondering uh, where the three-foot rule came from, uh, it actually came from the 1920s. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from uh, an investigation that measured the different distance between beds for soldiers who had uh, the uh, Spanish flu and that they found that once you were more than three feet apart, uh, the beds were more than three feet apart, the rate of infection was under 2% and this was considered acceptable at that time and that's how the three-foot rule came around. So if we create little circles around each person in the classroom, and uh, three foot in each direction, or six foot in diameter. Uh, we have a 30 square foot area, and we have 800 square feet approximately in a classroom. And so this is about the maximum number of students you could fit in re respecting the six foot uh, rule, which is about 18 and one teacher, and this leaves no extra room for anything else. So the total area and the volume is uh, 7,245 cubic feet. So if you change the air in this room once every hour, uh, that would be equivalent to 121 cubic feet per minute, or 6.36 cubic feet of air per person. Now, particles come in different sizes, and they have different settling rates. The droplets are defined as anything over 100 microns, and a 100 micron particle will settle in still air in about 3.1 seconds, falling about 1 meter, so 2 meters, 6 seconds and 2 meters. However, once you get to 10 microns, it takes 6 minutes uh, to fall 1 meter. And by then, the air currents in the room will probably sweep it and carry it off somewhere. And the 0.1 micron uh, takes 304 hours. And in a room with people walking and air moving, there's no way that particle will ever settle. So let's look at what happens when a person coughs or sneezes. So here are the really large particles. These are 320 microns. Your hair is about 100 microns in diameter, so you can see these particles when they come out. Now the smaller ones, 80 microns, is about the borderline between um, particles and aerosols. They stay in the air to some degree, but eventually fall down. 
However, the 20 micron particles actually uh, come out and then go up because of the thermal currents that the body has. So it carries, the warmth of the body carries the particles up to the ceiling. And the very small particles uh, also follow up to the ceiling. And when you put it all together, you can see what a mess this makes. And it's a good thing we can't see this. Although if we did see this, we might uh, understand better why you need ventilation and face coverings. And when the smoke clears, this is what's left. You see particles that have settled out on the person, on the floor, and on the ceiling. So what's the risk uh, with respect to COVID of all this? So if we look at the data from uh, Public Health Ontario, you can see that during uh, the pandemic, uh, especially up to uh, New Year's, the gray line is adults greater than 18 years of age, and the dotted line is ages 4 to 17. You can see there's quite a difference, a much lower rate amongst uh, children than adults. However, when you get to uh, week 10 of this year, you see those na lines converging. Uh, in fact, they look to be about the same. So what I've done is taken this data and broke it down into the three waves. So you see in the first wave from January to August of 2020, the level of infections amongst um, less than 20 year olds was lower than that of 40 and 50 year olds until about June and then they were about the same. Over the summer, uh, it was about the same. However, once you got to the school time, they both increased and they increased together. And this is when kids were in school. However, since February of 15th uh, of this year up till uh, April when, when the schools were closed, you can see that the level of infections for children were higher than the 40 and 50 year olds. And I chose 40 and 50 year olds because they weren't being vaccinated yet ec unless they were uh, essential workers. But you can see that the uh, second wave with the variants uh, had a different uh, response rate in, in children than the previous ones. And when you look at the infection rates among uh, school staff, you can see again, uh, it rises till about uh, the Christmas break and then after January, you can see it rising at an exponential growth rate. And um, that's probably a very good reason why we closed the schools in April. Dr. Osterholm, uh, who's an expert in infection control, has recommended that a guideline be established of when schools open. And he suggests that when there are five cases or less per 100,000 population, and if you had decreasing numbers of cases for the last 14 days and your hospitals have at least 25% extra capacity to handle cases. Ontario's red zone starts at 40 cases per week per 100,000, which would be 5.7 cases per day per 100,000. Now this number was actually corroborated by another study for the Center of Analysis of Longitudinal Data in Educational Research in the States. And uh, they also find that somewhere between 5 and 20 uh, daily cases per 100,000 uh, was where um, the, uh, the schools started uh, contributing to the problem. Now, we have a website which we call the Regional Risk Tool and Tips, uh, which provides escalating advice based on your region's COVID infection experience. And in it, we have um, five categories of different rates, and they are somewhat comparable to the provinces. And when you uh, compare these rates to the daily rates, you can see that ours uh, pink category matches up with Dr. Osterholm's and it kind of covers both the orange and the red categories of the province. And so when we applied Dr. Osterholm's criteria to the list of public health units, you can see that these 18 are all in our uh, Oak House uh, pink category um, and they're also in the control and restrict categories of the province.
and then we have another, uh, the rest of them that are below. And uh, we have two categories at the bottom, and we note that none of the public health units are in the lower end of our categories. Also on uh, fresh air this weekend, I don't know if you heard it, but Colin Furness was uh, speaking, and he's an infection control epidemiologist at the U of T. And he uh, suggested that the criteria for a reopening is quite complicated because within a, a, a school board, you have very different schools. Some schools are more riskier than others. Uh, also, there are different risk levels in the regions of the province. And he suggested that they leave it to the public health units and the school boards to sort this out. And he also recommended that they not open the schools unless you have universal testing, test every student and staff. He also mentioned he was quite worried about the B1617 variant, from, uh, which was originally identified in India and is now in the UK. And he suggested that since Ontario seems to be tracking UK's experience, except a few months later, he's worried that it may become dominant by September. And here's a, a news item that uh, confirmed what he was worried about, that uh, half to possibly three quarters of all new coronavirus cases in the UK are of the B1617 variant. So what about vaccination? Well, originally the vaccinations looked like they were quite effective. And uh, a recent article about the experience in Ontario showed that after the first dose, at f 14 to 20 days after the first dose, 48% were protected, and it rose up to 71% after 35 to 41 days. After receiving the second dose, um, seven days afterwards, the effectiveness rate was uh, 91%, but only 4% of these um, cases were the B117 variant, the one that was originally found in Britain. Another study, um, which was from the UK experience, showed that the effectiveness of the vaccines against this new uh, 617 variant was quite a bit lower, uh, where they estimated only 60% after dose 1 and 85% after dose 2 for the B117. And for this new variant, the 617, it was 45 and 76% uh, respectively. Also, a study in BC of healthcare workers uh, showed very low rates of vaccine effectiveness, 33% uh, after 14 days of the first dose and 78% after seven days of the second dose, which is much lower than uh, anticipated. And this population had high rates of the B117 UK variant. So we recommend uh, a program in our website of communicating, cleaning, hand washing, ventilating, distancing, screening, and masking. And I've been asked to focus in on the ventilation, but I want to make it clear it belongs in a continuum of other interventions. And this includes the removal and control of sources, holding off persons with COVID or screening them somehow. And this is part of the hierarchy of controls where the best control is at the source and then along the path and then worst is at the worker. So engineering controls are along the path and that's about the ventilation system. And then we have administrative controls to reduce occupancy in closed spaces and personal protective behavior, wearing masks and keeping distance. So we're talking about the ventilation system where uh, I'll just briefly describe it. Air comes in and gets mixed with returning air and either gets heated or cooled and then it's blown through a system of ducting uh, to rooms and then there's the return that comes back, some of which is exhausted and some of which is recycled. And he, when you go into a room and you see these louvers on the ceiling, these are the supply louvers and the grates that allow the air to return are these uh, great uh, opening 
Now, this is the way most ventilation systems are designed where you have the supply in the ceiling and the return in the ceiling. And what happens sometimes is that it shortcuts so the the air actually uh, goes to the return before it reaches the people. Some of it circulates. Uh, for infection control, a better design would probably to have the returns at floor level uh, in the corners so that the air would flow um, down and out rather than come past the people before it gets to the return. So I recommend strongly that uh, health and safety committees go on the roof and have a look at their ventilation system and open them up and look inside. Be sure to turn the power off before you do that and have a look inside. Is this what you want to breathe? Remember, all the air that you breathe has to pass over these filters and uh, the inside of this HVAC unit. And so uh, if you're making a to-do list, uh, go and look inside your HVAC unit. Now, measuring airflow the proper way is done with either a thermal anemometer where you drill holes in the pipes and uh, you take a, a pedo or, or a transverse and calculate the airflow. This is hard to do in most uh, HVACs because uh, you need a, a long length of straight pipe. Another way to do it is to cover up the uh, the diffuser with a billometer. I like to call it a little pup tent machine. And uh, it covers the hole and it measures the airflow as it comes out. And once you have these airflow measurements, you can calculate the air exchange rate, uh, which is measured in air changes per hour, or ACH. And here's a table that shows you how many air changes you uh, per hour you need to remove 99% of a contaminant in a room. You can see that with two air changes per hour, it takes two hours and 18 minutes, and this assumes perfect mixing in the room, which usually doesn't occur. Most uh, ventilation systems are designed to do five to six air changes per hour, which is about a 46-minute time length to uh, remove 99% of the contaminants. However, uh, often only about 10 to 20 percent of uh, these six air changes are actually outdoor air. And so uh, in order for outdoor air to come in, you need to set the thermostat fan setting on on and not on auto. On auto, it only comes on when it calls for heating or cooling. And so if you don't need heating or cooling, the fan will not come on and the fresh air will not come into the room. So uh, another thing on to your to-do list is to make sure the fan setting is on. As I said, only 10 to 25% of the air usually is outdoor air. And so if you have five to six air turnovers, you'll really only have 0.5 to 1.5 air exchanges per hour of outdoor air. And this assumes perfect mixing, which probably doesn't happen. Uh, perfect mixing means there's no dead air spaces in the room. Open windows and doors will give you more exchanges and possibly more outdoor air supply. If you go to 100% outdoor air supply, you won't be able to manage the temperature in extreme weather, uh, very hot or very cold. ASHRAE 262.1 is the design standard which is cited in the building code for building and operating ventilation systems. And they have two procedures uh, for prescribing adequate air. And this is prior to the pandemic. One was the ventilation rate, where you calculate the number of cubic feet per minute of outdoor air per person. And for a classroom, it was 15 uh, CFM per person or you can uh, prescribe the minimum quality of the supply air and you can use carbon dioxide as a marker of the exhaled breath that people have and how well it's diluted by the ventilation coming in. So CO2 is kind of a surrogate for outdoor air supply. And the Ministry of Labor back in the 80s uh, had a guideline for interpreting carbon dioxide levels. And if you were below 600, uh, that was uh, not a problem. A possible problem was 600 to 800. Uh, probable problem was 800 to 1,000. And more 
outdoor air was required when you were over a thousand. The World Health Organization has also recently put out a roadmap to improve and ensure good ventilation in the context of COVID-19. And they recommend for non-residential settings and natural ventilation, uh, 10 liters per second per person, which is 21 CFM per person, which is roughly equivalent to 900 parts per million. This document has uh, a number of good ideas on how to strategies for getting outdoor air into buildings using fans, special uh, air extractors or whirly birds, uh, and also uh, filtering. Now, when we measure carbon dioxide in a room, this is the pattern it usually takes. Uh, at the, in the morning, it rises and then it has a little dip during uh, the lunch break and then it comes up and reaches a peak. And then when people leave, it gradually decays and it starts at uh, 850 parts per million here at 5.45 p.m. And by midnight, it's down to 560 uh, parts per million. And from these numbers and the time that it takes, 6.2 hours for it to decay, we can actually calculate uh, the number of air changes per hour from the decay curve. And this is something that science students and physics students in high school learn. And so this would be a great project for uh, a high school uh, science or math or, or physics uh, class. If there are no occupants, there are no sources of CO2, uh, you can still test the ventilation exchange rate. So in the summer, uh, if you're wondering what, what it is, you can use carbon dioxide fire exchang ex uh, extinguishers and discharge them and then uh, mix the air with fans and then uh, measure the levels of carbon dioxide, uh, I would say at least e once every five minutes, if not more. And from that, you can calculate the decay curve and the air changes per hour. Now, this is a pension report for the uh, St. Raphael School uh, that was online uh, from the Toronto District Catholic School Board. And uh, this was the worst room, and you can see that levels of carbon dioxide were up around 26, 2700 uh, on the worst days. And even on the better days, uh, they were generally ab above 1,000. The proportion of time spent in the different bands is listed here. And from, these, uh, from this data, I calculated the air exchange rates, and they were somewhere between 0.2 overnight to 1.1 right after the, the school closed, and I imagine uh, doors and wi windows were open to air out the building. So 0.2 to 1.1 air changes per hour. Uh, this was the best room uh, when the, these measurements were taken, and again, you can see that almost every day is over uh, 800, and uh, many days were over 1,000. And again, uh, the air changes were calculated, and they were in the similar range from 0.3 to 0.9, even though the carbon dioxide level is different. And when you put them side by side and compare it to the table that we discussed earlier, you see that 0.2 to 1.1 air changes is going to take quite a few hours, uh, probably uh, more than four hours, to... Uh, uh, remove 99% of the contaminants. Now, if you think of uh, teachers and students in a room, and I've squeezed in uh, a few more students uh, just for example purposes, you can see that uh, for the ASHRAE standard, which was pre-pandemic, it required 2.5 air changes per hour. Remember, we got 0.2 to 1.1. And the WHO roadmap uh, recommends 3.7 um, air changes. And the EU ventilation standard, they're the equivalent of ASHRAE in the EU, recommend 8.3 air changes per hour, or 800 parts per million of CO2, or 30 CFM of outdoor air per person. And uh, the Europeans did a calculation of the risk based on these 
uh, air ch exchanges, and when you convert their uh, axes, uh, you see that 5.3 air changes had still had a 20% risk if there was a, a very infectious person in the room. Uh, however, um, for the Raf St. Raphael School, we're in this area of the curve at 0.2 to 1.1 air changes per hour. I understand that the second report has been uh, published and that the exceedances have decreased. They made changes to the window operation and include improved the maintenance of the exhaust fans, so uh, that did make a difference. However, uh, there's still exceedances, and it's like telling the police officer when he catches you going over 80 kilometers an hour um, that, oh, at least I wasn't going as fast as I was a few months ago. Um, you still haven't met the target. These targets are uh, similar to those recommended by other organizations like the American Industrial Hygiene Association, which basically said that the minimum would be 4.5 air changes per hour, which is a 90% relative risk reduction, but the preferred would be at least 6 to 12 air changes per hour. And this is similar to the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health recommendations, which uh, gave instructions, if you go to this website, on how to measure the uh, air exchanges in a classroom, and they give you a number of different ways, and their target is at least four to five air changes per hour. And if you list all the ventilation assessment criteria, you can see that uh, they have a lot in common. Uh, it looks like anywhere from four to six air changes per hour is the minimum, and uh, as much as possible is recommended. And the equivalent carbon dioxide concentration would uh, max out at somewhere between 700 and 800 parts per million. Now, you should realize that for children, uh, they have lower uh, CO2 generation rates than adults. Adults have 0.47 liters per minute, whereas a kindergarten child has 0.16. So this affects the... Uh, the levels that you need to achieve the uh, number of air changes per hour. And so you can see that for some classrooms it may be as low as uh, 800 parts per million, which is equivalent to the 1100 parts per million from the ASHRAE standard pre-pandemic. Now the Europeans are recommending that schools install uh, carbon dioxide detectors and they recommend this interpretation criteria that green is less than 600 parts per million, yellow is 600 to 800, and red is anything over 800 parts per million. And I just saw this um, newspaper article that says that uh, the Quebec government just put out a, a tender for 48,000 of these monitors for each classroom in Quebec. This uh, study is quite important. It was released uh, recently about mask use and ventilation and how they reduce the COVID incidence in elementary schools. And what they found that uh, the COVID-19 incidence was 37% lower in schools that required teachers and staff members to use masks and 39% lower in schools that improved ventilation. And of those who improved ventilation, they only used dilution, uh, they got a 30%, 35% lower incidence rate. But if they used a combination of uh, dilution, ventilation, and filtration, they got a 48% lower incidence. So that's better than just using masks by themselves. And uh, this is what this slide says. So why are we policing masking but not ventilation? OCAL has a ventilation checklist, which is downloadable in English and French, and it goes over 26 items in it, which include making sure that you connect uh, the people in the building uh, with the people who operate the system, increasing outdoor air supply, measuring your air changes, etc., uh, etc. Et this was um, put together 
quite early in the pandemic, so some of these uh, may not be quite up to date anymore. And if you're going to bring in lots of outdoor air, and if the temperature is at extremely hot or extremely cold, it is important to warn the occupants to bring extra clothing or to have uh, heaters, etc. Uh, opening windows and the use of barriers like plexiglass may disrupt design flows and you can use a soap bubble gun to actually watch the airflow to see if this is happening and find ways to correct it. The relative humidity also in the winter will be very difficult to maintain and you might need uh, steam injection humidification systems to uh, bring that level up. Portable air filters are also being relied upon and uh, they should not be used in place of supplying outdoor air, i.e. to reduce the cost of heating or cooling. They need to be sized properly, taking into account also the amount of noise that is tolerable. And they need to be maintained. Poorly maintained units will eventually put out more particles than they filter out. And as the filters age, they lose their electrical properties for particle collection, so they're no longer as efficient as they were when they were new. Here's an example of uh, some that, uh, uh, air cleaners that I found online. You can see the uh, clean air delivery rate number, CADR, CADR number. And it's roughly, uh, they use a rule of thumb of uh, for 70 CFM can service about 100 square feet of floor space. So you see here for 312 CFM, um, you could probably do half a classroom, but you would need 560 CFM for a full classroom. And uh, the noise level is important to note because the recommended background noise level for classrooms is 30 to 40 decibels. And you can see that these are all, at high speed, are all way over there. So you may not be able to run these at all times in the classroom at, f at top speed. Here's a, an evaluation of air cleaners in a classroom. And uh, here you had 27 students, one teacher, one scientist, and three or four air purifiers because that's how many they calculated they needed in order to uh, cover the full surface area. And also notice that the turbo noise setting was uh, 54 decibels. And again, that's over the recommended level. Uh, one of the units that is commonly used in schools is the Austin HealthMate HM400, and it's about $800. It refuses to provide a, a CATR rating, and it gives three-speed control, and the top speed is at 400 CFM. However, when you read the fine details, uh, these flow rates were calculated when the filter wasn't in the unit. And if you install the filter, the maximum is not 400, it's 350 CFM, or th which is, uh, would service an area of 360 feet squared. So you need two of these at least uh, to do an 800 square foot classroom. Also, the sound level is 65 decibels. Uh, so at 65 decibels, you can get two air changes, but if the noise is, is bothering you, then you, you go at low speed, you only get 0.4 air changes uh, per hour equivalent uh, from the filtering of the air. And again, remember, 30 to 40 decibels in the classroom. So here we have the previous um, graph that we saw, and if you add the air filtering uh, at the low end, 0.4, and at the high end with the noise at two air changes per hour, you're still not... Uh, you're roughly at around three air changes per hour, and you're still not at the 5.3 recommended by the European uh, Ventilation uh, Associations. And as I mentioned, old filters uh, can only produce, uh, in, in this study, was 20% of the original uh, cleaning airflow. So if you're going to... Uh, get into these units, make sure you do the homework, uh, size them and locate them properly and take good care of them. And uh, I was suggested that uh, I not talk about this, but I couldn't resist. Um, 
a few weeks ago on Marketplace, they showed uh, how to make your own air filter, and they compared it to a number of actual fil filters. And uh, the do-it-yourself unit actually worked quite well uh, compared to uh, the others and for a fraction of the cost. And this engineer online uh, has taken this and applied some airflow principles to it in that if you make a box instead of just pasting one over and then attach it to it and cut out a cardboard box to make it circular instead of square to prevent the air from circling backwards, and put it all together and put it on uh, stands so the air can get in underneath. You can get 800,000 uh, uh, CFM uh, cleaned through this and for a much cheaper cost. Again, this would be a great project for uh, a science uh, class in high school or maybe even grade school. What about plexiglass? Barriers. Well, if you think of cigarette smoke, uh, let's say the teacher was smoking in the room. <laughs> I know that's not uh, happening, but uh, as an example, uh, you can watch the airflow move across the room, and when it reaches a barrier, it actually creates eddies and whirls down. It's like when you put your paddle uh, into the water and you see these little whirlpools following it. And so, um, plus, uh, you can smell the smoke. Uh, just, you know, uh, think of a smoker being on, on the other side of the, your plexiglass and how long it will take before you smell them. Plus, it also interferes with the design airflow and, and can trap emissions. Jeffrey Siegel, U of T, uh, who's an expert on filtering and cleaning uh, uh, air systems, uh, talked about UV systems. I saw on your list that uh, there are plans to spend a lot of money on uh, UV systems. His opinion was that none of these technologies have been proven to reduce, reduce infection in real buildings, even if they have promised based on tests in laboratories or idealized settings. Some of them actually produce substantial concerns about secondary issues such as ozone production and UV. And so uh, if you had a choice between more air or this type, I would uh, put my money in the more air rather than UV. Now, what about the variants? Uh, there's increased transmissibility and investigations, contact tracing investigations in Australia and New Zealand have shown that transmission is occurring outside the close contact zone, which is defined as 15 minutes uh, within six feet of a person for it. Um, in the EU, because of this, um, people are being asked to wear N95s in retail and mass transit areas. So this makes the full spectrum of controls even that much more poor important. And when it comes to masks, uh, an N95 has a 90 to 99 percent uh, filtering capacity. It only allows 1 to 10 percent inward and outward leakage, whereas a surgical mask is a 50 percent level of leakage and uh, filtration. And a cloth mask is even worse with 75 percent leakage. I don't know if you've seen the uh, CBC National, one of the reporters wore one of the blue masks and here he's being tested using a quantitative fit testing machine and he had a fit factor of two which was similar to the previous slide for these types which is 50 percent. Now the person taking the measurement is wearing an N99 uh, which has a 99 percent uh, or a fit factor of 100. And Unfortunately, in Ontario, we see these type of things going on where people are being asked to remove their N95s or N99s and given surgical masks. So they're removing a, a mask which has a fit factor of 100, which means 99% of the particles are being uh, stopped and asked to put on a a mask that uh, only stops 50%, which is utterly ridiculous. If I would have told hygienists this could happen uh, before the pandemic, they would have looked at me as if I had two heads. And now this is happening while in Europe they're being asked to wear N95s in public.
Anyway, um, the Riva has put together a summary of some practical measures for building services operations during the pandemic, making sure you have adequate ventilation, switching on the ventilation at least two hours before the building opening time and running it at least two hours afterwards. Uh, if you have carbon dioxide demand controlled ventilation settings, uh, either turn them off or set it down to the background level of carbon dioxide, which is 400 parts per million. Open windows regularly. Uh, keep toilet ventilation in operation at a nominal speed in a similar fashion to the main uh, ventilation system. Avoid opening windows in, in bathrooms uh, to make sure that you have a negative pressure in the bathroom that the air flows into the bathroom and not out. Instruct building occupants to flush toilets with the lid closed. Switch air handling units with recirculation, which is most of them, to 100% outdoor air, again, if possible. Inspect heat recovery equipment to make sure that leakages are under control. Ensure adequate outdoor air ventilation in rooms with fan coils and split units. These are the... Um, zone uh, control systems. You've got to make sure that they s always supply a minimum amount of outdoor air. Uh, do not change heating and cooling uh, and possible humidification set points. Uh, you don't need to change the temperatures. Uh, carry out scheduled duct cleaning as normal. Uh, replace central air, outdoor air and extract air filters as normal according to maintenance schedule and regular filter replacement uh, should be also okay. And at the last one, but not least, introduce indoor air quality or CO2 sensors uh, that allows the occupants and the facility managers to monitor th that the ventilation is operating properly. If I can add a few, I would also add, make sure the fan setting is on uh, and not on auto. Make sure your air exchange actually measure your air exchange rate and uh, using the CO2 decay curves, especially if every uh, um, classroom is going to have a, a monitor, uh, you can log the data and calculate the uh, air exchange rates, the air changes per hour. Have a look inside your HVAC unit, check to see that the filters are fitting snugly, that there's no way for the air to circumvent the filters. And if you're going to use portable air filters, make sure you do your homework, size and locate them properly, and take good care of them. If you have natural ventilation, i.e. no forced air, use open windows and doors to get more air into the room, and use fans to boost the airflow through these openings. And consider installing a forced air ventilation system this summer. And I want to also add at the end, we did a survey of education workers uh, in November and December of last year, and we are about to publish these results. And we asked them about their protective equipment, whether it was appropriate and adequate supply, and that's the green category. But um, these other categories are needs not quite met until the most severe uh, needed but not available. And here are some of the results. And you can see here that N95 masks were uh, one of the worst performance of all the PPE. And the others following it were eye protection and gowns. And when you put them all together, the perceived adequacy of um, in-person workers at schools, about 18% had less than half of their PPE needs met. And when you looked at infection control uh, measures or procedures, again, we see that uh, workers wearing masks, 67%, uh, two-thirds thought uh, that was adequately um, and appropriately implemented. However, students wearing it was half that, about a third. When it came to physical distancing, only 15% thought it was appropriate and adequately implemented. And uh, the ventilation system, you can see here, 39% uh, uh, found it lacking, and 28% didn't know. So there's a lot of uh, questions about it. Uh, when we looked at the infection control practices needs, 
almost two over just over two thirds of the respondents said that less than half their needs were being met. And we also looked at the anxiety symptoms um, and depressive symptoms, and we found that 60% uh, scored moderate or severe on these scales, which are used to screen people clinically for depression and for anxiety uh, uh, be behavior uh, problems. And 46% scored positive for the depression. When you compare the anxiety scores to uh, other Canadians, which was taken at the beginning of the pandemic, March to May of 2020, 46,000 uh, Canadians, the average was 18% in the moderate or severe uh, levels, although uh, it ranged by age and also men and women. When we put these two together, the pro the proportion of their needs being met for personal protective equipment and for infection control practices, and sh correlated that with the percentage of people who screen positive either for anxiety, for anxiety, um, working remotely, working at home, not being at school, 55% uh, screen positive for anxiety not working at all was 71%, but you can see a clear rise that if your 100% of your personal protective needs were met, you had a lower level of screening positive for anxiety than working remotely. And when it came to infection control practices, the difference was even more extreme. Here you're 26%, uh, which is close to uh, the Canadian average, uh, whereas if none of your infection control practice needs were met, 78% uh, screen positive for anxiety. And this has been published, uh, if you're interested, you can, uh, this has been published for healthcare workers and for non-healthcare workers, and we're, we have a publication in in review right now for the education workers. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and I'd be glad to entertain any questions if you have them. Thanks.